Hi everybody, my name is Dan Moran. I'm the president and founder of Concierge Diamonds in Los Angeles, California. Uh, as we approach Christmas season, and it's the most popular time of year for people to be buying jewelry, getting engaged, and thinking about large jewelry purchases. So I've noticed a large volume of questions coming my way uh, from Reddit, from Facebook, uh, in, in my email, on the phone. People are sending up smoke signals. People are so confused about what it is to buy a diamond and to buy uh, diamond jewelry. So. I thought I would uh, jump online and talk to anybody who wants to talk to me about it directly and see if I can help you guys uh, sort out the, the noise from the signal. Uh, I'm looking forward to speaking with you. This is my first time trying something like this and uh, hopefully it'll be a useful and informative event for everybody involved. I'm going to silence my phone now since it just started making noise because um, I don't want to be distracted. I want you guys to have my full attention. So the phone is officially on silent. Now I'm with you. Uh, before we talk about uh, anything to do with diamonds, a little bit of background about me. Uh, I've been in the diamond and jewelry business for about 13 years. Uh, before that, I worked in technology for a number of years in the software business, uh, and I uh, find myself now as a refugee from tech. But uh, my heart is still uh, there to some extent, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tech nerd, so I follow a lot of that stuff. I just don't do it these days. My family's been in the diamond business for almost 100 years now, primarily in Israel uh, and in New York. So my parents were on 47th Street in the Diamond District in New York for about 30 years. They're now happily retired for the last 15 years or so. Uh, my uncle in Israel today, my mother's brother, is one of the largest diamond manufacturers in the world and has been active in the Israeli diamond market for about 40 years. And my great uncles, uh, on my mother's side were among the founders of the diamond exchange in Israel. In fact, one of my great uncles has his name on one of the bridges between buildings in the diamond exchange in Israel. Uh, my uncle on my father's side was a diamond cutter on the wheel for many years. Uh, I have jewelers and setters and any number of diamond experts in my immediate and extended family, brokers, dealers, you name it. If it's in the world of diamonds, somebody at uh, my family's holiday dinners can tell you about it. So having been to a lot of holiday dinners with my family, I learned a lot about it as a kid, and uh, as much as I tried to escape it and do other things, just when I thought I was out, the business pulled me back in. So now, 13 years later, uh, I, I'm doing this full time. I love it, actually, as it turns out. It's really an, a fun and interesting business. It lets me be a part of really happy and warm moments in people's lives. And the technical aspect of it I find stimulating and challenging, and there certainly is a lot to learn. There's, once you start scratching the surface of what makes a diamond pretty. It turns out you can dive pretty deep into the world of diamonds and there's a lot to know. So on that, uh, on that note, I hope that tells you a little bit about kind of why I'm qualified to be talking to you about this. Uh, let me talk to you about this. So, <coughs> excuse me. I'm sure that a lot of you have heard the phrase, the four C's of diamonds, the very iconic classic uh, explanation of what makes a diamond pretty. So there are four attributes that are the primary governors of value in a diamond. Now, they, they're not a complete picture. I don't want anybody to think that because you know the four C's, you know everything there is to know about a diamond. There's a lot more than that. But the four C's are a pretty good starting point for a layperson to learn about diamonds. Because, look, if I was going to teach you everything there is about diamonds, first of all, I don't know everything. But if I were to teach you everything I know, well, then you might as well get in the jewelry business. Um, and you don't have that kind of time. So the four C's are a pretty good window into the world of diamonds by which you can get a, a handle on what you're looking for when you're looking for a diamond. So the four C's of diamonds are carat weight, color, clarity, and cut. And what I'm gonna do at this point is spend just a few minutes talking about each one of those so that uh, we can distill it down to learn what's important about each of these attributes of a diamond. So our first C is carat weight. Carat weight is really very straightforward, right? When you put this, the, the stone on a scale, this is a diamond scale right here. Uh, when you put the stone on a diamond scale, you weigh it and find out what it weighs. So uh, it shouldn't surprise anybody that weight is weight. A carat is simply one fifth of a gram. So 200 milligrams is one carat, five carats is one gram. There's nothing magical about carats. It's not some kind of uh, obtuse or obscure unit. It just turns out to be a convenient unit of measurement for weights of diamonds. The more a diamond weighs, the larger it will be. So carat weight is the 
uh, is the me measurement we use to talk about diamond size. But it's really an indirect measurement of diamond size, right? It is the weight. It's not the diameter. It's not the dimensions. It's the weight. So because diamond is a material of uniform density, right? It's all made of the same crystal. The more it weighs, the larger it will be. And of course, the more expensive it will be. Larger diamonds, heavier diamonds are more expensive than smaller ones. What's important to know about carat weight when you're looking at diamonds is that it's not a linear relationship between weight and price. It's an exponential relationship. So doubling the weight will not double the price. It will increase it much more than double. So if you think that, hey, uh, one carat diamond is $5,000, so a five carat diamond must be $25,000, you're gonna have a bad time. That's just not the case. Um, increasing the carat weight will exponentially increase the price. So if a one carat is 5,000, the equivalent five carat might be 200,000 or 300,000 or some huge amount of money. So as you're shopping for a stone, it's important that you bear in mind uh, that the as you increase weight, the price will go up very, very, very quickly. And that's really all there is to know about carat weight. Color. Our second C of diamond grading is color. And color is a very important aspect of a stone. Now, why do diamonds have different colors? A diamond is a crystal that's made out of carbon, and that crystal was formed very, very deep underground many, many years ago, typically between a billion and 1.5 billion years ago. Deep underground, under high temperature and pressure, this carbon solution crystallizes into diamond. But sometimes, as that carbon was crystallizing, there's something else present in the ground there. Maybe there's nitrogen, maybe there's iron, boron, cobalt, whatever happened to be in the ground. And that other chemical sometimes could mix with the liquid crystal before it solidified and give that diamond an overtone of color. Once the crystal is solid, it's virtually impenetrable. Nothing's getting in there. But during the crystal formation phase, other chemicals can leach in. And that's what gives diamonds color. So we grade diamonds on a scale from D to Z, with D being absolute pure crystal clear, no overtone to it whatsoever. And the farther we get down the alphabet, you might see a little bit of yellowish or greenish or brownish or grayish creeping in. So the more color the diamond has, the less expensive it will be. So what your goal should be if you're choosing a diamond, say for an engagement ring, is to find a diamond that is white enough that it looks white to your eye, right? And that's very important, to your eye, not my eye, not your friend's eye, not a salesman's eye, not the gem lab's eye, your eye. Find a diamond that looks white enough to you and and try to stick it around that color because there is a real financial consequence to going up in color um, as, a, as a rule of thumb it's not a perfect rule but as a first approximation if you hold everything else about a diamond constant going up one color costs about 15% so that means going up three colors can cost 50% or more so you have to be careful not to just jump to the top of the color scale uh, or you will very quickly find that your budget is being stretched to the max and at this point, what I'm going to do that I, I'm not able to do when I'm answering questions uh, typing, I'm going to jump in my safe and grab a couple of different colored diamonds and show you what the difference in diamond color really looks like. So let's pull out my little box of stones. Just a few examples here. I'm not going to belabor this point too much, but I think it's important that you see the difference. So, let's start with a D color stone. Here's a stone that is extremely white. Show it to you face up. And then I'll put it here on just a white background of paper, okay? And here's a stone that's also white, but slightly lower in color. Again, I'll show it to you on its own and next to the D color. And here's a stone that's quite a bit darker. And again, face up and next to the first two. So this is a D, this is a G, this is an L. Now, that difference is visible, sure. But let me make it more obvious. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip the stones upside down so that the brilliance of them can't hide the color anymore. See the difference now? 
That's the essence of a color of a diamond. This stone, assuming for a minute they were all the same shape, same size, same clarity, you'd expect this stone to be quite a lot more expensive than this stone, and the middle stone somewhere in the middle. And that's exactly how diamond color works. So sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, and so I don't know what that means a video is worth, but hopefully that helps you see colors uh, in a practical way. And I'll flip them back face up one more time to remind you that these differences that are very pronounced in the stones upside down are a lot less pronounced face up. All right, so that's color. Let's talk about our next sea of diamonds, which is clarity. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, a diamond's a product of nature. It's a crystal that's made out of carbon. When that crystal forms, however, it never forms uniformly. It never forms perfectly. There are always imperfections in stone flaws. The industry term is inclusions. And I guess we say inclusions because it's bad marketing to say flaws. But when you hear the word inclusions, you can think flaws. It means the exact same thing. So as you would expect, the more inclusions a diamond has, the more flaws it has, the less expensive it will be. Now, to my personal philosophy of diamonds, clarity is probably the least important of the four C's. Uh, because, look, cut is something you can see across the room. If a diamond is well cut and sparkly, you'll see that right away. Size, carat weight is obvious, right? You know what's bigger and what's smaller without having to have it explained to you. And color, likewise, I just showed you that you don't need to be an expert to see the differences in color. Clarity, on the other hand, you typically really need to be a diamond grader to see the difference between different clarities, so long as they're over a certain minimum. Now, this is called a diamond loop. It's a 10 times magnification magnifying glass, and it's a tool that typically diamond dealers will use to observe clarities of diamonds. So if I wanna look at a diamond for clarity, what I'll do is I'll get it out, I'll pick it up with a tweezer so that uh, I'm not getting my, my fingerprints on it or smudging it, and I'll hold it up to my face to evaluate clarity. And what I'm doing is looking inside the diamond under magnification to see what imperfections or flaws I can see inside. My advice to you as you're shopping for a diamond is to treat clarity as a, as a hurdle to be cleared, almost like a high jump bar. You wanna find a diamond that's clean enough that there are no obvious imperfections that bother your naked eye. So there should be no flaws that you can see when you hold the diamond kind of like this at the end of your arm and look at it. It should look clear to your eye because if there's a big black dot right in the middle that you notice every time you look at it, that's gonna bother you. But once it's over that, that hurdle, once you've cleared that high jump bar, once a diamond is clean enough that nothing's bothering your naked eye, you don't necessarily need to spend the money to get gemological perfection. Uh, there, there is such a thing as a flawless diamond. And by the way, even a flawless diamond isn't really flawless. It just means that under a certain degree of magnification, namely 100 times magnification, you can't see anything. But if you go 1,000 times, maybe you can. So even a flawless diamond isn't actually flawless. It's just no flaws over a certain size. And I would argue that the only really measurement that matters is your naked eye. So let me see if I can find another example of two different clarity stones that will illustrate what I mean. And in fact, I can. I'm gonna show you two diamonds side by side that have very different clarity grades. If I can get them out of their paper. There they are. All right. And I'm deliberately here not gonna to try to show them to you under magnification. I'm just gonna show them to you in real life. Because let's face it, you're not gonna look at diamonds under magnification in your daily life. You're gonna look at them with your own two eyes. Let's see if I can get them straight on my finger. So there's two diamonds. One of them has a higher clarity grade than the other. Can you tell which is which? Yeah, at this range, neither can I. And that's the point. One of these diamonds costs about 40% more than the other based on its clarity. I don't know about you, that doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense to me. Why would I spend more money on a difference, a quality difference that I can't see? Why would I spend money on an attribute of a stone that's invisible to my eyes? I wouldn't, so I don't recommend that you do either. So that's clarity. Um, get the lowest clarity that you feel comfortable with and don't spend money on gemological perfection. Now it's up to you to decide how high your personal hurdle is how high your high jump bar is. 
But once you're over that bar, it doesn't matter if you're over by this much or this much or this much. Make sense? Awesome. Our fourth C is cut. Now cut is at once the simplest aspect of diamond grading and the most complicated aspect of diamond grading. So the simple aspect is, well, what shape are we looking for? Are we looking for a round? Are we looking for a princess? Are we looking for an oval, a pear shape, etc., etc., etc.? What shape of diamond are we looking for? The more complicated aspect of diamond cut is, for each particular cut, it is precisely defined and very well understood what the correct way is to cut it. In other words, the ratio of the length to the width to the depth, the relative size of this central facet, which is called the table, compared to the diameter of the stone, the sizes and angles where all these facets meet each other, the thickness of this central facet called the girdle, the angles and sizes of all these facets, the size of the tip of the, of the diamond, the culet, they're all precisely defined how you're supposed to cut them. And today with modern technology, we're able to very precisely measure whether any particular stone is cut correctly or not. Well, when I say that stuff out loud, it always makes me ask myself the same two questions. The first question, why do we care? Why do we care about these angles and ratios and relative sizes? Why do we care about these proportions and dimensions? Well, the reason why we care is because a diamond doesn't do anything, excuse me, when you're buying a diamond, it's not like buying a car or buying a cell phone, right? A diamond doesn't have performance. A diamond doesn't do anything. Its only job is to be pretty. The reason why it's pretty is because it sparkles. The reason why it sparkles is because it's a prism, right? Diamonds bend and refract light very, very powerfully. So these angles are, are designed to optimize the diamond's ability to bend light. So the more closely a diamond adheres to its ideal cut proportions, the more completely it will refract light from the top and the more sparkly it will be. And I have a little visual aid that I printed out for the purposes of this, uh, this talk because I can't draw it well enough to make it obvious. So let's pretend that this is the ideal shape of a diamond as viewed from the side. Right? You can see that light comes in from the top, bounces around inside, and comes back out the top. Because remember, down here is somebody's finger. So light that comes down there gets lost. It hits a finger, you don't see it anymore. So we want this shape so that the, as much light as possible comes back out the top. But what if, instead of cutting it this way, what if we cut a diamond like this? Either too deep, too tall and skinny, or too shallow, too short and flat. Obviously, these are exaggerated, right? So imagine the differences are a little bit smaller. Um, now, as you can see, some of the angles aren't quite right. This, these are less optimal light returns. Some of the light leaks out the side or out the bottom. These two diamonds will appear less brilliant than this one. So that's why we care. It's about making the diamond as brilliant and sparkly and pretty as it can possibly be. Unlocking as much fire in the stone that Mother Nature gave us as we possibly can. So that's why we care. Well, the second question I always ask myself is, well, if we know what the correct cut is, because we've studied the physics, if we know how to measure, because we have the machinery to do that, and if we know why it's important, because we want to optimize light return, why don't we just cut diamonds perfectly every time, right? Why is there such a thing as an imperfectly cut diamond? Uh, after all, the first three C's, right, uh, carat weight, color, and clarity, are given to us by Mother Nature. There's nothing we can do about them. But cut, we can affect. A diamond is cut by a skilled cutter. Why doesn't he get it right every time? What's with these lazy cutters cutting diamonds wrong? Well, it's not as simple as that. We have to remember that a diamond is a product of mother nature. I don't know if you guys have ever seen what diamonds look like when they come out of the ground. Let me show you. So, these are diamonds. As, as found coming out of the ground. They don't look like much, do they? they? Look like gravel. So if you're a diamond cutter, you have to take this crazy looking thing and say to yourself, I wanna maximize the cut quality, get the best cut I can out of this thing, but I also wanna get as much carat weight as I can. So I have to compromise between the ideal cut and the maximum weight, because as we talked about, carat weight is worth money. 
So the cutter is always making that choice. Do I maximize the weight or do I maximize the cut quality? And sometimes compromises have to be made. And that's why you find imperfectly cut diamonds on the market because they're more weight efficient, so they're more production efficient. There's less wasted material. But they won't sparkle as well as a well-cut diamond will. So I personally tend not to show or sell or advise my clients to work with uh, off-cut diamonds. But there are plenty of people in the market who do do that, and they can sell those diamonds for cheaper because their cost basis is lower. You can find an imperfectly cut diamond for 10, 15, 20, maybe even more percent off than a well-cut diamond. But it's not gonna sparkle like a well-cut diamond. It's gonna sparkle like a piece of glass. So if you wanna buy a diamond that looks like a piece of glass, go spend five bucks and buy a piece of glass. Don't buy a diamond. I think the, the cut is what unlocks the brilliance of the stone, you know, and it's in many ways the most important of the four C's. Because at the end of the day, if you take a so-so piece of rough diamond, a, a material that came out of the ground, and it's, it's okay, but it's not amazing, and you cut it perfectly, it will still look beautiful. But if you take the highest quality rough diamond in the world and cut it badly, it's not gonna sparkle. So at the end of the day, if you don't cut it right, What's the point? That's why I don't work with, with poorly cut diamonds. It's why I don't advise that you buy one for somebody that you love either. So that's my brief primer on the four C's of diamonds. Uh, we've gone through carat weight, color, clarity, and cut. The fifth C that you should always consider is cost. Make sure that you have a budget in mind before you go and shop for a diamond. And then remember that you'll be trading off those four attributes, one against the other, to get the best stone that you can within your budget. At the end of the day, you're always going to be dialing up one attribute and down the other, tuning in to find the diamond that has the best balance of the four C's for you. And work with an expert who can help you figure out what the most efficient and effective way to spend your money is by balancing the four C's one against the other. So that's it for me on this topic. I'm looking forward to answering questions. Uh, please email me with whatever you've got. Contact me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on Reddit. I'm Diamond Dealer on Reddit. Facebook, I'm at Concierge Diamonds. You can always email me at ConciergeDiamonds.com. And I will be getting back to you with answers to questions. I hope this was helpful. Thanks, guys.